If Neanderthals ever walk the earth again, the primordial ooze from which they will rise will be an emulsion of oil, water, and DNA engineered in the laboratory. For now, the Neanderthal genome is an abstract string of billions of DNA letters, stored in computer databases. But it naturally sparks the imagination, could scientists use that genetic blueprint to create proto-Neanderthals in the flesh? In the not-so-distant future, advances in genetic engineering might enable that feat, but whether such a resurrection should happen is another story altogether. What makes modern humans unique? Scientists have taken another step towards solving an enduring mystery with a new tool that may allow for more precise comparisons between the DNA of modern humans and that of our extinct ancestors. At least 93% of our genome is shared with archaic humans, according to a study published in the journal Science Advances. What's more, humans and Neanderthals share up to 98.5% of our DNA, when you take into account that humans have up to 5% Neanderthal-specific DNA. Furthermore, an estimated 20% of the Neanderthal genome exists in living humans, so finding living DNA would not be so difficult. That's a pretty small percentage, that means only 1.5% of our DNA is not shared with Neanderthals. This kind of finding is why scientists are turning away from thinking that we humans are so vastly different from Neanderthals. The findings underscore that we're actually a very young species. Not that long ago, we shared the planet with other human lineages. Since the birth of a dolly the sheep, the world's first cloned mammal, scientists have greatly expanded and improved on cloning techniques. They have cloned dogs, cats, rats, pigs and cows, among other species. In 2003, researchers in Spain were the first to bring back an extinct species, the Pyrian ibex, a wild mountain goat, though the clone only lived for a few minutes. All of these examples relied on a technique called nuclear transfer. Starting with an intact cell, fresh or frozen, of the animal they'd like to clone, scientists first remove the nucleus, where DNA resides, and insert it into a hollowed-out egg cell of the same or a related species. This hybrid egg is then implanted into the uterus of a female surrogate for gestation, and voila, the surrogate gives birth to a clone. But there are no intact Neanderthal cells, far from it. Decoding the Neanderthal genome meant piecing together many DNA fragments painstakingly extracted from 40,000-year-old bones. So how could cloning be possible? In his book, titled Regenesis, Harvard geneticist George Church proposed a different approach for cloning extinct animals whose genome has been sequenced. It starts with a healthy cell of a closely related species. Cloning a Neanderthal, for example, could start with a stem cell from a modern human. Using new tricks of genetic engineering, researchers could make adjustments to the DNA in the human cell so it matches the code of the Neanderthal. That's more difficult than it sounds, as there are millions of spots in the genome that are different in modern humans and Neanderthals. A new technique, called CRISPR, makes it possible to edit multiple sites in the genome at once. With that research, genome engineering of mammalian cells just took a big step forward. Though the techniques aren't sophisticated or cheap enough yet to recreate a Neanderthal, the idea is plausible. Going from engineered cells to whole organism has been especially well established in mice, and there's no obvious reason why it would fail in other mammals. If a human cell could be Neanderthalized, it would be implanted into the womb of a surrogate mother, either a woman or a chimp, and then develop into a fetus. But this step, too, would be extremely challenging. We know from cloning experience that there's a very high failure rate. In the case of the Pyrian ibex, for example, the Spanish scientists created 439 eggs containing the extinct species nuclei, but only 57 developed into embryos. Five survived the full term of pregnancy, and just one was born. Numbers like that would likely inflict a heavy emotional and physical toll on human surrogates. But what is most likely to happen is that they're going to get really sick, or have lethal mutations. And you're going to get a lot of dead proto-Neanderthals. Wait, that's not good news at all. Even if a clone did survive, 
the ethical dilemmas of raising a Neanderthal would be complicated. In some ways, Neanderthals were similar to modern humans. They used tools and created art, and they likely had the mental capacity for language and abstract thinking. In other respects, though, Neanderthals were quite different. They went extinct before the agricultural revolution, so they would probably have difficulty stomaching our modern diet, heavy in grains and dairy. Their physical appearance, short and stocky, with big heads and strong muscles, would make them stick out, too. You can imagine there would be a serious emotional toll to be raised as a Neanderthal kid with a bunch of non-Neanderthal people. For example, if the Neanderthal child was far stronger than modern humans, he or she might be excluded from playing sports team. If intellectually disabled, or intellectually gifted, he or she might be put into isolating educational programs. These ethical issues are important to consider in any cloning project. For any species, we want to maximize the chances that they will be born and live physically and socially healthy lives. Neanderthals lived in small social groups, so they may be very antisocial and have a difficult time communicating, regulating their emotions and their primal urges which are all fundamentally necessary to live in a modern world. Indeed, some scientists wonder whether there is any valid scientific reason to bring back a Neanderthal clone. You can have a Neanderthal genome growing in a human mother, but of course the environment and development, and also the educational environment and cognitive stimuli surrounding anyone being born these days would be totally different from a Paleolithic environment. Rather than bring back a whole Neanderthal, some scientists say it would be more useful, and ethically palatable, to focus on making a few of its cells. This approach could uncover biological differences between Neanderthals and humans, allowing anthropologists to better understand the two species' divergent evolutionary histories. Once only an idea in science fiction, today the extinction is poised to become reality. Researchers working to bring back animals like the passenger pigeon and woolly mammoth discuss the implications of their work. But the Neanderthal genome changed everything. In 2010, after scouring Neanderthal bones found in a Croatian cave for bits of viable genetic material, scientists released the first draft of our ancient cousin's genome. It rocked the field of anthropology for revealing, among other things, that some of these stocky, big-headed hominids had interbred with the ancestors of modern humans. Neanderthal's climate, diet, and disease exposures were not the same as those of our ancestors, and left different adaptive marks on their genome. And yet Neanderthals are far more similar to modern humans than the animals commonly used to study, such as fruit flies and rodents. There are issues that humans have now, where it's very plausible that Neanderthal biology might actually show us something. Our knowledge of the evolutionary process could guide us toward possible treatments. For example, a study found that modern humans carry variants in genes related to the immune system that Neanderthals did not. To learn more about the biological consequences of these genetic differences, you might take a human immune cell and make it more Neanderthal like, and then see whether or not it has the same kind of capacity to respond to pathogens. We're looking at an ancient population that had thick, dense bones and strong muscles. If you could find some way to tweak human biology in a way to make it more Neanderthal like, you could make modern humans much stronger. Neanderthals also had much larger eyes, suggesting they had better night vision and hand-eye coordination. For now, the technology for studying Neanderthal biology remains out of reach. But many experts predict that it's only a matter of time. The primary difference between modern humans and Neanderthals lies in differences in the structure of the brain and the shape of the skull, and the brain is the most difficult organ to clone. I want to thank today's sponsor, Brilliant. You can learn interactively with their hands-on lessons in math, science, astronomy and technology. Indeed, with Brilliant, anyone can understand concepts in science, technology, engineering and math. Rather than just solving repetitive problems, we teach you the intuitive ideas behind topics like algebra, statistics, algorithms, and much more you'll come to understand how science actually works, and how it's relevant to your everyday life.
you'll get hands-on practice with real problem solving, which helps you train your scientific thinking and problem solving skills. For example, you will learn how to write a computer algorithm, find the center of an object's mass, learn the principles of astronomy and calculate the boiling point of water. Brilliant starts by explaining why the concept actually matters, and what it's all about, with interactive visuals. Brilliant is a fun and interactive way to learn real problem solving and deeply understand science. Join the millions of people already learning on Brilliant with a special offer just for highly compelling viewers. Head over to brilliant.org forward slash highly compelling to get started for free with Brilliant's interactive lessons. The first 200 viewers will also get 20% off an annual membership. Click the link in the description below, which also helps support the channel. Thank you. However, scientists have already used human stem cells with a gene from our extinct big-headed relatives to produce brain organoids that differ in appearance and behavior. We're trying to recreate Neanderthal minds, say the scientists. Until now, researchers wanting to understand the Neanderthal brain and how it differed from our own had to study a void. The best insights into the neurology of our mysterious, extinct relatives came from analyzing the shape and volume of the spaces inside their fossilized skulls. But a recent marriage of three new fields, ancient DNA, the genome editor CRISPR, and organoids built from stem cells, offers a provocative, if very preliminary, new option. At least two research teams are engineering stem cells to include Neanderthal genes and growing them into minibrains that reflect the influence of that ancient DNA. Scientists have coaxed stem cells endowed with Neanderthal DNA into pea-sized masses that mimic the cortex, the outer layer of real brains. Compared with cortical minibrains made with typical human cells, the Neanderthal organoids have a different shape and differences in their neuronal networks including some that may have influenced the species' ability to socialize. Scientists in Germany have also started to make organoids with Neanderthal brain genes, but he stresses that the technique can introduce unintended mutations. There are lots of control experiments to do, and we are quite hopeful we'll overcome those doubts, say the scientists, who plan to compare Neanderthal brain organoids to those made from chimpanzee or modern human cells. The German scientists focused on one of approximately 200 protein coding genes that differ between Neanderthals and modern humans. Known as NOVA1, it plays a role in early brain development in modern humans and also is linked to autism and schizophrenia. Because it controls splicing of RNA from other genes, it likely helped produce more than 100 novel brain proteins in Neanderthals. Conveniently, just one DNA base pair differs between the Neanderthal gene and the modern human one. Scientists start with skin cells from a neurotypical person, someone without any known genetic defects linked to neurological disorders, and manipulate their genomes to turn them into pluripotent stem cells. Using CRISPR, the team then targets NOVA1 and swaps in the Neanderthal base pair to replace the modern human one. To avoid being misled by the off-target DNA changes made by CRISPR, as well as genetic errors that can occur from producing the stem cells, they sequence the resulting cells and discard any that have unintended mutations. It takes several months to grow the Neanderthal DNA, containing stem cells into organoids, they call them Neanderoids. Comparing them with modern human brain organoids made under identical conditions, his team found that the neuronal cells with the Neanderthalized NOVA1 migrate more quickly within an organoid as they form structures. Scientists think it's related to the shape of the organoid, but have no idea what it means. Neanderoids have a popcorn shape, whereas modern human cortical organoids are spherical. The Neanderoid neurons also make fewer synaptic connections, creating what resembles an abnormal neuronal network. The German scientists developed the modern human brain organoids to the stage where they can detect oscillating electrical signals within the balls of tissue. They are now wiring the organoids to robots that resemble crabs, hoping the organoids will learn to control the robot's movements. Ultimately, scientists want to pit them against robots run by brain neanderoids, and create a true freak of nature.